from you, I guess. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started and um, folks trickle in. They'll just jump up to speed with us at their own pace. So thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon for Be a Drought and Climate Hero, Hike the Divide Film Viewing and Daily Acts Panel Discussion. Um, my name is Connor Devane. I see him pronouns. I'm a programs coordinator for Daily Acts and uh, director of the film Hike the Divide. Um, joined here by a few of my Daily Acts colleagues who I'll introduce in a moment. We want to express a deep, deep gratitude to the city of Petaluma for all of their support and making events like this possible. So a few of you are entering in the chat where you are joining us from. I mentioned that I'm in Forestville, but a little more context is that I am on the traditional land of the Southern Pomo people. Um, so I wanted to share for anyone who's not familiar, uh, this tool called nativelands.ca that is a way to start engaging with the history of the land that you find yourself on. So if you go to this link, which I believe Serena is dropping in the chat for us, you can type in your address and see who, which people have lived and continue to live on the land you find yourself on, who have stewarded it for millennia and continue to do so today. This is really just a jumping off point to engaging with that history and the people who are part of your community, um, but a crucial first step to, so that you can start learning that history. Um, so if you feel called, we'd love to uh, hear whose traditional lands you're joining us from today as well. whether you use the tool or if you know offhand. That's all right. Um, I encourage you to check out the tool on your own time if now's not a good time for you. So with that, I will pass it over to Trayton to lead us in some grounding. So yeah, good to be with you all today. Um, as you'll see in the conversation that Daily X takes a holistic approach to inspiring action on drought, climate, and everything else we do. And part of this is seated in the awareness that all change begins with awareness. And so one of the practices we do from inside our organization to our leadership and other things that you'll hear more about is just the simple act of breathing together, which literally is to conspire together. And so if you feel comfortable, go ahead and you could either close or lower your eyes or just get comfortable and feel your feet flat on the ground. And just take, uh, we're just gonna take a moment and just to land and breathe in through your nose. And take a slow, gentle, deep exhale through your body. Just notice that there's any sore, stuck spots, any bits of tension. And then another deep, long, slow breath in through your nose. And gentle exhale down through your body. And just bring your attention to the in and out rhythm of your breath. And then just briefly bring your attention to something that you feel grateful for, given the many challenges we're facing in our lives in the world today. Gratitude is an important practice as well. Just breathe that gratitude in, again, breathing in through our nose, slow, gentle exhale down through your body. And if you're just doing, joining us, we're just starting with a couple breaths to land and ground. And then go ahead and bring your attention back. I encourage you to use such practices. It helps us enormously organizationally and in our coalitions and such when we're navigating a lot of complicated issues in territory. Uh, back to you, Connor. 
Thank you, Trayvon. I definitely needed that. <laughs> so um, today we have uh, three daily actors presenting and leading this discussion. So as I mentioned, my name is Connor Devane. Um, I made the film Hike the Divide and I work as a programs coordinator for Daily Act. We have Trayton Heckman, Daily Act's founder and executive director. And we also have Carrie Fugit, who is the program manager of our Leadership Institute. I'm excited to be here tonight. We're going to hear a little bit more from each of us in just a few moments. Um, I see a lot of familiar names on our attendee list today, but for anyone who isn't familiar with Daily Act, I'll just give a really brief introduction to, to who we are and then just a few words about the work we do. So Daily Acts is an environmental education nonprofit that takes a heart-centered approach to inspiring transformative actions that create connected equitable and climate resilient communities. We believe in the power of our daily actions to reconnect people to self, to place and to community, which in turn helps to heal the planet and our society. We have many, many different strategies and tactics for doing so. Um, I, we're gonna hear about uh, many of these in the presentation today and in the interest of time. Um, I think we'll just move, move into the meat of the event here. So really quickly, um, I'm sure most of us are familiar with Zoom at this point, but um, we are in a webinar format. So we'd love to be hearing from you throughout the event. Uh, we have the chat box function that enables us to do so. If you could make sure that on your chat window, you have your settings um, set to all panelists and attendees so that we can all see what you have to share. If you have questions that come up during the webinar, we're going to have question and answer portions after each segment of the presentation and then a broader discussion portion at the end. So if you could enter those in the Q&A box, we'll be able to keep track of your questions so they don't get um, lost in the fray. And an important note, we're going to be mentioning quite a few resources and links to help you drive change in your personal life at home and in your community. Don't worry about writing all these down in the moment. We're going to be dropping them in the chat, but we're also going to be sending you a follow-up email with additional resources later this week uh, so that you don't have to, you know, open up 30 tabs during this webinar. So for this event, we're going to start out, the three of us are going to talk to you about a little bit about what brought us here um, and then talk about some paradigm shifts. But before we do that, we'd love to hear a little bit from you. You know, what, what brought you to register for this event and then show up here today? Maybe it's something you're curious to learn about, um, given our drought context. Maybe you have a climate solution you're really excited about that you wanted to share, maybe you watch the film, uh, or maybe it's just the way that you're feeling lately with the many, many things going on in the world, in our society, with the environment. Um, whatever that is, if you feel called, we'd love for you to share that in the chat. No, just give a couple moments. John Tribbs watched the film, liked it, thank you. <laughs> Wants to support, has some knowledge on water and plants. Uh, great knowledge to have, especially in our drought context. Is anyone else feeling called? Okay, here, I've got a few more coming in the chat. Awesome, thank you all for sharing. Let's see, Donnell lives in the area of Petaluma that is getting some big pot farms and wants to be able to get involved to try and prevent these. Todd is feeling drawn to enter more fully into the conversation about care for the earth with other local individuals and groups, seeing some common themes, wanting to build community with other people who also care about this topic. 
um, sharing ideas, sharing knowledge, sharing skills, a uh, question about what local communities can do to promote, promote drought and water conservation. So we're, we're gonna be getting into a lot of these topics. Um, so thank you all for sharing these with us. It'll help steer our conversation. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about what brought the three of us here. And we're going to be talking about shifting paradigms, which are, it's a huge concept, right? We're here for a pretty brief time um, so I just want to, to set some expectations that we're going to be talking about things at a pretty high level, kind of bird's eye view. Um, like I mentioned before, we will be sharing resources with you. Uh, we're available for, you can email us with additional questions. We have more programs coming up in the future that delve into the specifics of the topics we're going to be addressing today. Um, but everything is going to fall under this concept of the power of small. We're going to be talking about personal ecology to sustain the chain, things you can do in your personal life to deal with overwhelm and be effective in um, driving change. We're gonna be talking about drought and a different way of looking at water, ways that you can impact drought and the water cycle at home. And we're gonna talk about civic engagement and collective action, how we can combine our power together. Um, and we'll have a Q&A, like I said, after each of these sections and then a broader segment at the end. So without further ado, we're gonna share some of our stories and I will lead us off. And uh, this would be the point, Serena, if you could launch our first poll, just to give me an idea of how much context to share before um, launching in. I'd love to know um, if you had a chance to watch the film Hike the Divide yet or not. And of course, no worries if you haven't. And I, I don't know if you can give me a thumbs up if the poll is. Thumbs down. Uh, Serena, are you? Oh, I see a question in the chat I can answer real quick while we're sorting through. A, um, oh, here we go. It just popped up. And so, Melissa, yes, you will be able to watch the film online at any time. We'll include the link. Um, I'll, I'll send it to you now, but we'll also include it in the follow-up email. We'll just give about a minute for folks to, to answer the poll. All right, so we got about half and half. That helps me a lot with my next part. So thank you for, for sharing in the poll. So I, I grew up in suburbs of, and big cities my whole life up until college. My experience with the, the more than human world or nature, if you prefer, was mostly like sports fields. And sometimes it wasn't even real grass. Um, I had a lot of experiences when I was in college that had me questioning my place in the biological community of Earth rather than just on top of Earth that led me to um, hike a long trail from Mexico to Canada, the Pacific Crest Trail, that really split my perspective wide open and got me much more concerned about ecological breakdown and climate change. So after five months of hiking, I moved to Portland, Oregon. Uh, those who watched the film, this would be familiar, but I was working in a service industry job and spending as much of my free time as I could volunteering with organizations like 350.org in the climate movement, trying to oppose fossil fuel infrastructure projects that would be built in our area. Um, and to a lesser extent, pushing for sort of progressive, creative climate policy. And I burned out really fast, 
looking at the scale of these problems that we lump into this kind of umbrella term, climate change, it's not, it's just so much to take in and you're, you know, pushing to stop these little projects in the context of a global problem. It takes so much energy and it's hard not to burn out. And that was definitely my experience. Um, and I felt drawn to kind of run away. I wanted to go back to the mountains and have this lifestyle that had me, you know, sleeping on the ground, drinking from springs and streams and living much closer to the rest of the community of life. But I also wanted, I, I didn't feel right to walk away from what I saw as the work that was needed in the world. So I had the idea to combine a long hike of the Continental Divide Trail with a storytelling project, interviewing community organizers, activists, everyday people who recognized the problem and decided to do something about it. They had a whole spectrum of approaches for doing so. Um, you know, there's probably 11 different styles of taking action that you'll see in the film. Um, and two of the biggest takeaways that I got from this experience of the hike, talking to people and making the film were that hope follows action and not the other way around. You know, when you're sitting in the grief and overwhelm of these massive problems, for most of us, that's not a very motivating place to be in. And I really like the phrase, grieving hearts need working hands. When you start kind of putting your shoulder to the wheel and thinking creatively and collaborating with your community, hopes flows from that, which leads to my other big takeaway, which was the importance of community. You know, if you're, there are things that we can affect as individuals, but the impact is exponentially compounded when we bring in one other person or your street and your neighborhood, and it just grows and grows. Um, so that's sort of the, the cliff notes of the film. <laughs> and what I learned is what brought me to Daily Acts, seeing the potential for the collaboration of people taking small actions, focusing locally, focusing not on fighting against, but fighting for a vision of a future that works for everyone. Um, and to kind of encapsulate that, there's this tool I learned um, from Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, who's a marine biologist and science communicator, um, and diagram. So asking yourself these three questions separately and then trying to synthesize them, which is what is the work that needs doing? What are you good at? and what brings you joy? With the idea being not only is this is what you should do, but this is the recipe for, for being effective, improving your own life and that of the people around you in addition to um, your environment, your community. Um, and this is kind of a much more articulate version of what, what brought me to make the film and find my path through Daily Acts. So with that, um, I will pass it over to my colleague, Carrie, to share a bit about her own journey. Thank you so much, Connor. And thank you everybody for being here tonight. Um, it's an honor to be in community with you. Um, my name is Carrie Fugit, and I am, like Connor said, the Leadership Institute Program Manager for Daily X. And I am joining you from Coast Miwok land. Um, and my journey towards discovering the power of small for transformational change is really my realization um, about the power of relationships. And one of my favorite things that daily actors say um, that me, Trayton brought into us was uh, that nature sustains the web of life through networks and communities. And what sustains networks and communities is relationships. So this quote in front of us is one of my favorite by Margaret Wheatley, that the depth of relationships between individuals in a system determines the strength of a system. So my kind of aha moments um, throughout my journey of, of looking for answers of what can I do um, is recognizing that over the years, my search has evolved into what can I do and with whom can I do this with? 
What relationships do I need to nurture and grow? What collaborations will help me make larger transformations bigger than my own personal ripple? And how can what I can do and what can be done be done in a way that builds community and inspires new connections across difference? And what I think is really special about how Daily X does what it does is it has infused this how into everything we do, taking the act of installing a rainwater catchment system and gray water system, which we'll talk about later tonight, but infusing it with doing it in a way that builds community and inspires connections and friendships and a sense of belonging, um, because that really is the foundation of um, sustaining this work and being in community is feeling like we belong and that everybody belongs, whatever their background, culture, life experience, age, ability, gender identity, but everybody belongs in this community. And that's how we really make systems change. It's a culture shift. It's a mindset shift and it's shifts of social systems that move from individual actions to collective collaborations. And that's what makes Daily Acts one garden turn into hundreds of gardens in a weekend and one action turn into thousands. It's this level of change, the collaboration and transformation that requires really strong relationships. Um, and I appreciated what John shared tonight, what can his question about what can local communities do to promote drought water conservation. And I would say, in addition to the technical skills that we're offering tonight and the paradigm shifts about the climate water nexus, I would say also approaching this question through what relationship buildings and bridge buildings do we need to do to strengthen and, and grow our communities um, by showing up for each other, by asking for help, by keeping open minds. And for me, it's really been crossing my issue divide. Um, what this looks like for me and has over my journey as a drought and climate activist is um, kind of the idea of like getting my communities back, um, offering mutual aid, showing up for um, folks who care about issues that aren't necessarily climate or drought right out of the box, but do build a sustainable, healthy community, like showing up for our hotel workers or farm workers and helping meet people's needs where they're at so that it makes it possible for even more people to take these skills and tools that we are sharing today and engage in drought and climate actions. Um, so I wanna close with this, um, that learning and educating ourselves is a really important first step. And our responsibility as drought and climate heroes is to take that knowledge into community and to listen, build relationships and bridge across difference. Um, listening with open ears and open hearts, holding humility to what we don't know and putting relationships before being right. Um, one of the phrases that we use at Daily Acts is moving from ego systems to ecosystems. And this shift uh, lays the foundation for co-creating a feeling of belonging across all backgrounds and cultures. And it's really the secret sauce that turns your gray water system into systems change and adds to the amplifying ripples and turns those ripples into waves of new ways of living sustainably in harmony with nature and with each other. So my closing line would be that networks are a beautiful solution to systems change. And the exciting part of that is, is that we are all part of this network, all part of these communities, and each of us can be part of that solution. So with that, I will turn it over to the well-known and um, nationally respected um, Trita Heckman. Let me uh, unmute myself. Thank you so much, Carrie. And yeah, you know, when we were talking about this, this panel of there's so much urgent action needed on so much fun, on so many fronts, it's important that we, we dive into actions. And the more we've been talking about lately, this paradigm level change and these more holistic approaches, as Carrie and Connor have mentioned, are so critical to then get to the effective on the ground action. Um, and so, you know, a thing that I often think about, I've thought about for about half of my life is that with so much heartbreaking difficulty and constant crisis in recent years and more interconnected crises, it could be easy to be overwhelmed and burn out like Connor mentioned. And especially the way these crises, you know, the climate crisis exacerbates the drought we're in, that exacerbates the fires, that exacerbates the inequality because with disaster comes increased disparity. And so it's so important that we take a holistic approach in these things 
And one of my mm -hmm. driving, you know, questions of, of, for myself and for others is how do we, amid so much difficulty, how do we just stay awake and engaged and sustained through time, through years, through decades, through a lifetime? It, it's so incredibly important. And like Connor and Carrie mentioned, to me, it keeps on coming back to the power of small. And that's what it's been coming back to for decades of, of letting our heart break and finding and follow our inspiration and then returning the only power we have, that of our daily actions. Um, and that when we take action within the power that we have, rather than just being overwhelmed by it all, it's called our, our circle of influence. This idea of you have a circle of influence that's close in and then a circle of concern that could be as big as the world. And the more time we spend in our circle of influence, our influence grows. Our daily actions get more effective, more powerful. And you know, a second piece of that, which we'll touch on, kind of touch on a bit later, is the power of small gardens to grow food and sequester carbon dioxide emissions and catch the rain and sequestering CO2 actually then helps recharge and hold water in the ground to rehydrate landscapes. And also gardens are sources of, of beauty and nature connection and got these amazing mulberries, these like two, three inch long mulberries that are raining down right now in our garden. And, and it, it honestly sustains me in such a powerful way in the work as well as just the wisdom of nature and that literally we could learn nature's operating instructions in a garden that could apply from how we grow effective organizations and coalitions to shifting how our cities do policy. Um, you know, so there's a lot that you could do in a garden and then, you know, power of small groups as a part of that paradigm change too. Again, the problems are so big, but you know, it's amazing what Daily Axe has been able to do over a couple of decades with tons of partners. I know folks on the call like John Shribs are involved in small groups and, and working with our agencies like the city of Petaluma. We've been working with the city for 15 years on water wise solutions and installing you know, water conserving, carbon sequestering, food producing habitat, producing gardens. Um, and so when we work together these small groups with our agency partners and our business partners and, and our neighbors has an enormous amount of power. Um, and so, you know, just the last piece I want to touch on personally for me, you know, in addition to just returning to the power of small that helps me sustain through time is claiming space, you know, it, different levels of privilege and opportunity, but I got to be away in, in uh, hiking beautiful granite up in the Sierras this weekend in the rain and going towards waterfalls and, and just meandering around and pathfinding in nature. And I think we all need to get out in nature, whether it's you know in your neighborhood or farther afield to recharge, reconnect um, and, and just get renewed, just gain new insights for this important complicated work. Um, so with that, I'll kind of close out on that piece and we'll, we'll move into the some of the content sharing around what does it look like to embody these paradigm changes at a, at a personal level or in homegrown actions. But before that, just want to maybe stretch or move your body if you need to, breathe, get back present, and put in the chat if there's anything that resonated with you for your own story, your own needs, your own passions, your own case of burnout. You just know what, what resonated, if anything, from the things that Carrie or Connor or myself shared. And this is a picture that Connor put up of, uh, that's Horsetail Falls, which I've driven by a zillion times over 15 years. I finally hiked it um, the other day, which is super beautiful and lots of critters and such. Um, oh, Sphinx Moth, nice. <laughs> so Melissa said the concept of hope following action is really poignant, definitely a good reminder. And John Shribs mentioning we connection and community to bring, which you bring to the table in a very productive way. <laughs> Thank you. And seats at the table for all of us, which we're going to get into a bit. There's this amazing growing amount of civic engagement that is occurring that people on this call are involved in. And if you aren't, we want to get you engaged in as well. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll segue in now just to touch briefly. And again, we're gonna, I'm gonna touch a little bit at the personal scale and then Connor's gonna talk about home scale action and a new water paradigm. And then we're gonna talk a bit about civic engagement. And so at the personal scale, you may think like, okay, what does, you know, personal leadership in these, I'll pause and let you read the quote first. <laughs> 
I was just having it as background, but it is a good quote, so I will, I will read it. So this is a quote from the film, uh, Alexis Bonagowski, who's a, a rancher and journalist in Billings, Montana. She says, it's easy to be cynical and it's easy to not do something. For me, it would be an easy way to live, to feel like you can't make a difference. It takes courage to be hopeful. So in that regard, building that presence, that awareness, that courage, the support we need to be courageous of, you know, like why talk about a paradigm level, this kind of complicated, heady thing that Connor mentioned. And so as, you know, famed system ecologist Danella Meadows long ago wrote, the top place to intervene in complex systems is at the level of the paradigm or thinking. This is what informs policy, our rules, our culture, it's the invisible water we swim in of how things happen. And so if we want to change our lives, our communities, our world with all these crises, we need a new way of thinking and relating. And so in that regard, you know, we start everything with personal leadership from in our organizational practices to the Leadership Institute. And it's this Gandhian be the change of you know, we start with ourselves. And so that enables us to be more effective with our groups. And then you can move out into coalitions and communities and get into much more complicated change. And so as you see in the middle of the picture, like what, like what do they say when we're on a plane is put your own oxygen mask on first before assisting others. Um, and so this is incredibly important to sustain in this work, especially as things only seem to be getting more difficult and complicated. Um, and you know, I recently was speaking with a, 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 a high level water author and leadership expert. And he had mentioned like water management is more about people management as most things are. Like Carrie said, it's the ego system, not the ecosystem that we have to work on. And so just wanna to touch on a few key points on this um, is developing and honing your personal compass of you know, what inspires you? What are you passionate about? What is your, where's your sense of purpose or calling? What are your strengths? What do you wanna be doing? Some of the things that Connor touched on in that intersecting circle. And the more we could stack up these really powerful intrinsic drivers of curiosity and passion leading to purpose, a sense of autonomy or mastery, community connectedness, like these are really powerful human motivators. And so dialing in on yours for each of us can help us sustain in the work of the difficult changes. It also starts to change our identity and our values, which is really critical. Um, so developing and honing your compass is a first key. Second is habits and practices. You know, this is like the basics we all know of good rest, of, of exercise, a healthy diet. Meditation and reflection practices are incredibly important. Um, daily and frequently with as much complexity in the world as simple things like journaling uh, are, are incredibly effective for a personal or at a leadership scale. And so these, you know, there's also this idea of doing a daily compass practice of start your day, even with a few minutes, center in the garden, breathe, state a personal mission statement, focus on your gratitudes, how you wanna creatively solve the problems you're chasing for the, you're changing, uh, you're, you're working with for the day um, are, are super, super important pieces. So, you know, developing and honing your compass. And these are at the core of the Leadership Institute program that Carrie leads as well. And we've been implementing these organizational and daily acts for most of our 20 years. Once we realized how critical this stuff was to affect significant change and to sustain through time. Um, and then just double down to those habits and practices that you probably already know you want, need to be doing more. So this is just the encouragement to support that and to not beat ourselves up or shame ourselves about what we're not doing, you know, be kind and compassionate. Uh, but, you know, it's part of putting our own oxygen mask on first. And so, you know, that just a couple, like really just a couple tips and reminders of the importance of this easy to overlook thing when we're running to chase and put out fires and address, you know, drought and all these really big issues to start with the self-care. And so I just wanna ask you a couple questions to reflect on briefly, and then we'll do a little Q&A on this piece of, you know, where do you feel curious or a sense of passion? Maybe a sense of purpose or calling. And just jot it down if you have a piece of paper, you're on the computer or something, or make a mental note of it. And then what one thing 
if you did differently would help you in staying renewed and inspired and sustained with all these incredible challenges we're uh, maintaining. It could be exercising, it could be, you know, getting better rest, it could be going for a hike with a neighbor or friend or, you know, any number of things. But what one thing for you feels most important right now to put your own oxygen mask on first so you could be a best support for others in your community in taking drought, climate, and community action? And perfect. Serena put some of our personal compass questions in the chat. So now we'll go ahead and um, if there's any questions or comments you have or you want to share what your one thing is that you need to do, you know, it helps to be seen by others. It encourages us to take action in that way. Um, so we'll just take about five minutes or so and, and love to hear from, from any of you. Um, about if you have questions about this territory or just things you wanna share as well, maybe your own practices for how you sustain. More daily aerobic exercise. Yes, absolutely, John. That's been I, that's changed my world since COVID. I've been walking a lot more and it, it's a phenomenal difference to relieve stress and stay healthy. Excellent point by John, sustaining gardens like the one behind me while working full-time jobs is very difficult. <laughs> Good area to practice self-compassion with all of this stuff as we're doing our best, but it all seems kind of larger than life. Nice, Todd. Yeah, identity change, relating differently with the earth. And, you know, more that culture, a lot of indigenous cultures have of the rocks, the trees, the critters are all our, our people, our relations. Definitely helps to have uh, have our engaged elected officials and, and and agency staff and this stuff is we've we've led meditation exercises in the middle of fire crisis with room full of emergency workers and high level electeds and all kinds of other folks because we all kind of need to ground and and you know make sense to be effective when we're doing this work. <clears throat> Do people, I'd be curious for folks, do people recognize or think that doing these sort of personal leadership, self-development, self-care practices does or can make a difference for you to be more effective in saving water and mobilizing drought and climate action, these sort of activities? And if you don't think so, I'm happy to share that truth too. Whatever, whatever you're thinking, it'd be great to hear, hear folks' thoughts in this territory before we transition to a uh, water paradigm and home scale action. All right, well, feel free to drop it in if you still want to put something, but up. Oh, um, yeah, definitely the bad news on the TV and you know the new term of doom scrolling. It's easy to get overwhelmed by everything going on. So getting more important to manage the content we're taking in. Very good, thank you. We'll keep on chiming in on the chat and I'm gonna pass it over to Connor now to talk a bit about new water paradigm. Thank you, Trayvon. Yeah, so we will be talking about the power of small, but obviously a paradigm shift is not small at all. So uh, I'm gonna have a very difficult task of trying to cover 
basics of the new water paradigm in just a few minutes. So just to reiterate, this is the high level view. I love talking about these concepts. If this kind of sparks your curiosity and you wanna follow up, please don't hesitate to email me. I'm happy to have more in-depth conversations about these concepts, but to get started, just to set a little context, I know from looking at the list of folks who are here that many of us are Sonoma County residents, Californians, um, it's probably not news that we are in the midst of an acute drought emergency. Um, most of the state is officially in drought. Much of the Western US is in drought. You know, then this isn't, this isn't really new to us, right? Just a few years ago, we experienced something similar and we learned a lot of really great lessons in 2015 about conserving water. But what really got me thinking is how do we break this larger pattern of drought or how do we start to kind of turn the tide back on this, this cycle of drought as we hear kind of, you know, if we're maybe if we're doom scrolling, scrolling as Trayvon mentioned, in you know, journalistic coverage of climate change or scientific articles, whatever you're reading, that climate change is going to exacerbate the intensity and the duration and frequency of droughts. We don't wanna just be acting in a reactionary way. We wanna be proactive. We want to be kind of repairing the harms that cause this drought in the first place. The conventional wisdom tells us that it's, it's climate change and that's true but there's a lot more to it. And I'm going to enlist the help of uh, Charles Eisenstein to succinctly explain what I would surely spend way too much time getting into details about. So I'm gonna switch over to a YouTube video here and I'll uh, see you in a few minutes. When we think about climate change, we tend to think about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere warming the planet. Carbon is so central to our thinking about the climate that many other important aspects are excluded from the conversation. One of these things is water. Actually, the dominant greenhouse gas. But its global effects are difficult to measure because it doesn't spread out evenly in the atmosphere like carbon does. Its effect on temperature also depends on the many forms it takes. When it takes the form of a haze, it has a warming effect. When it takes the form of clouds, it has a cooling effect, except for at night in which it has a subtle warming effect. Since atmospheric water is hard to model, it tends to get ignored. But temperature is not the only important aspect of the climate here. If the climate can be warm or cold, the climate can also be wet or dry. The rampant rise of floods and droughts of our time are said to be caused by climate change, but really they are climate change. While temperature does have some effect on rainfall, floods and droughts are primarily caused by disruptions to the hydrological cycle. We tend to think of the water cycle this way. Rain falls, water evaporates, condenses into clouds, and repeats. But this is only part of the picture, since a lot more happens underground. Healthy soil is like a sponge that soaks up a lot of water. Some of it is taken up and stored by plants, and some of it percolates deep down into aquifers. This groundwater wells up and feeds springs and streams, which allows even more life to thrive. There is then much more water to evaporate from the saturated ground or to transpire through plants. This abundance of water vapor allows for more consistent rainfall. So what happens if we cut down the forest, plow the grasslands, and expose the soil? Without trees or plants to buffer the rain, the heavy downpour compacts the soil. The water can't soak down into the compacted ground, so almost all of it stays above ground and we have a flood. Almost all this water runs off, carrying loads of topsoil with it. And when the rain stops, the little water there is left evaporates very quickly, leaving the ground compact and dry. This lack of percolation depletes the groundwater over time, so it can't feed the streams, which dry up. Now there's no water in the land to feed rain clouds, and we have a drought. If a rainstorm does come, it just creates another flood and worsens the subsequent drought. Instead of consistent rainfall, we have a flood drought cycle. Fortunately, it is possible to reverse this trend. There are ways to regenerate ecosystems and restore the water cycle pretty rapidly while feeding people in the process. Making subtle changes to the land's topography can slow the flow of water, allowing more of it to soak into the ground and be used by plants. Plants with deep roots help break up the compacted soil, allowing water to percolate deeper. Everyone has a place in reversing the climate crisis. Whether you're working to protect healthy ecosystems, regenerate damaged ones, or just helping yourself or your neighbor depend a little less on industrial agriculture, you are helping the earth heal. So, a 
very compact package about a lot of really big concepts. I'm going to resist the temptation to dive too much into details, but before I move on to the next slide, I'd love if you could share, I know some people are entering things in the chat now, if there's something from that video that surprised you or that challenges a belief that you already had about drought, about climate change or about water or the water cycle as a whole, I'd love to hear um, any big takeaways. And while you think about that, I'll just move us to the next slide that is comparing the way that we have traditionally looked at water as a civilization to the way that the new paradigm, new water paradigm proposes we think about water, water cycles and watersheds. So John says SCWA is, which is the, the water agency currently doing hydrology modeling taking all this in. Um, I'd be interested to hear more about that. On the vineyards, it would depend on a lot of factors of how were they installed? What was there before? Did they take out a lot of trees? Are they using chemicals? So there's a kind of wide range of factors as to whether they'd be beneficial or not. I would add that whether they are any given vineyard is currently beneficial or not, there's enormous potential for any given vineyard to be to implementing practices that are beneficial to restoring the water cycle. Um, one thing the video did not touch on that I would add, um, if you noticed in the diagram when they're showing the water cycle, the water was evaporating off, I'll go back to the photo real quick off of the land rather than the ocean. A lot of times we think of the water cycle as water evaporating from the ocean and falling off land, which is part of it. But what's really crucial to determining local weather and temperature is this what's called the small water cycle. So that's water that evaporates from a region, from the soils or groundwater, from plants, and then falls as rain in that same region. And depending on what part of the world you're in and what that ecosystem is like, that can account for 35 to 90 percent of that region's precipitation, which is huge. Even 35 percent is a huge percentage. So when rains get taken over by the large water cycle, rain coming from the ocean, that's associated with less frequent, more intense rains, as the video showed. It's not really what we want. Um, I see in the chat Todd mentioned that Nature is an interconnected system and drought is not just about water, but the relationship between water and landscape. And that is definitely one of the biggest takeaways for me. When we look at this comparison between the old paradigm and the new paradigm. And to me, kind of the subtext here is in the old paradigm, we're looking at water as this sort of inert resource that can be useful to humans, usually only once, and then sluiced off the landscape back into the ocean, or at worst, it's an inconvenience that needs to be rushed off the landscape. And we see that like with our streets and you have the um, you know, di irrigation ditches along the streets that channel things into the storm drains and run things off the landscape as quickly as possible. Whereas the new paradigm, we're really embracing what indigenous and traditional cultures have been telling us, which is that water is sacred and crucial to all levels of life and that instead of rushing it away, we need to be retaining it locally as much as possible. And that kind of goes back to what Trayton was saying about with personal leadership and considering gratitudes. We need to be grateful for every drop of water that falls on the landscape, whether it's on our roofs, in our yards, in our communities. We can do that in two ways. There's the concept of slow it, spread it, sink it, and store it, which are techniques to take the rain, the precipitation, for us it's rain, but in some places snow, right? Where taking it and spreading it out across the landscape, trying to slow down its journey to the ocean or prevent it from getting that far and evaporating locally instead, and recharging, 
our groundwater and our aquifers or even storing the water in rain tanks so that we can extend the rainy season and have healthier plants that sequester more carbon. And again, I'm feeling the urge to keep spiraling into more and more details. Um, the other idea is to be creative about the reuse and recycling of water. So for those of you who watched the film, you'll remember that there was an interview with someone named Rowan Guyot Sutherland who um, builds Earthship homes. And Earthship homes will, the, with the water they catch from their roof, with something like nine inches of annual rainfall, which is very little. I mean, this, he lives out in Taos, New Mexico. We get more rainfall than that in what we think of as a dry county here in Sonoma. They can provide a family of four's entire water needs because they're reusing and recycling their water four times, right? You have drinking water that is then purified to be your sink and shower water, which is then used in toilets, which can then be used on non-edible landscape plants after it's treated. And so really just treasuring every drop of water at every step in its journey is the key to recharging the small water cycle which as we learned has a huge impact on the climate and the local temperature and especially extreme weather like droughts, floods by extension, wildfires, big storms, it's all connected and there's so much there. So like I mentioned, I am more than happy to go into more and more detail about this. You will have my email if this is ex exciting to you as it is to me, because if we're combining our efforts, you know, if I'm, running my laundry water, as we see in this diagram, out to my landscape, that's good for my soil. It's not gonna have a huge impact on the climate, but if I get all my neighbors to join with me and they get their friends and family to do the same, and then we push or we advocate for, you know, broader change that it's the city is incentivizing people to do this, the, the potential just keeps snowballing. Which we're in conversation with the city about and, and developing some of their drought response programs of how do we scale out these gray water systems, which we've partnered them on for over a decade. And now, you know, it's a good time to kind of up our collective ante on that. Mm -hmm. So with that, I probably went over time so we can switch to questions. Uh, if anyone has questions in this moment about the new water paradigm or the drought, the three of us can try to answer those for you. And it looks like Carrie just took one on in the chat, um, which is a fascinating question, which is how much the fires contribute to the drought. Lisa heard that the burnt char on the soil makes it harder for the soil to absorb the rain. And as is the answer for any concept in science, it's always, it depends, right? <laughs> so it depends on how hot the fire burned, extremely hot fires can make, and I'm, I'm reading Carrie's answer, uh, extremely hot fires can make soil hydrophobic, which means it can't absorb the rain, but low intensity fires are good for soil because they spark new growth and new vegetative growth helps the soil health. So intensity of fire is critical here, which is why controlled low intensity burns are okay. That is an excellent answer, Gary, thank you. <laughs> Do we have any other water paradigm questions? I know it's a big concept to, to take in all at once in just a few short minutes. While you're looking, Connor, I'll just say that, you know, because we've had the, the power of small as a paradigm change in Daily X for a long time. And as we, and we've been doing these solutions in partnership with the city of Petaluma and other agencies for well over a decade. But like what Connor is saying of really, as we understand the system's ecology on the small water cycle, it, it really shows that our small individual and collective actions when done together at scale can have a massive difference. Um, and, and both on our action, but also we'll get in civic engagement in the next section of changing the discourse and policy, as was noted in the video, um, climate, you know, the climate water nexus is often the fossil fuels that water takes in its use, which is a very small part of the greenhouse gas emissions, but the regenerative water approach, water as the biggest greenhouse gas, is an important thing to be talking about in our communities with each other and with our policymakers. Absolutely. Yeah, there's there's a lot of fascinating information about the difference in climate or temperature even from a forested area that's directly adjacent to a developed area. And it becomes clear the more and the more we learn about these dynamics, 
that the micro can have an impact on the macro. And so I see John says, capturing water in containers now in sink and shower and using in landscape. We're fortunate that our local, local watering recycling plant is increasing their water reuse in local landscapes. Absolutely, the more that we can, well, first, I love that you're doing the home scale solution. That's great, especially for people who are big on cold showers. If you have to wait for your shower to warm up, you should be catching that water and reusing it if you can. But the idea of having this um, become a cultural shift, a paradigm shift, if you will, that at the institutional level where reusing and recycling water and really treasuring water for the, the sacred resource that it is, um, you know, astronomical impact. The relationship, like you're saying, Connor, too, long before we had all of our various gray water systems that are placed with the laundry and the constructed wetland of just that bucket in the sink, like John mentioned, you're saving that water, it increases your connection with what's going on in the landscape, the needs, you see the beautiful sphinx moth or something, you know, the gratitude, it, it starts to shift our relationship too. So there's the water you're saving, but those sort of actions do a lot more for us as well. I'll take this last question before, before we move on to civic engagement. So Dale said, our HOA is considering replacing turf with rocks. Doesn't seem like a good idea. What help is available for such orgs? So we have a lot of really great resources about alternatives to turf lawns that are not just using rocks that will actually help store water in the soil, which helps with fire resistance soil health, which sequesters carbon. Again, this virtuous cycle of benefits um, will include a resource about sheet mulching and a few other concepts. But in terms of trying to get that change for your HOA, to me, I would start with what relationships do I have with other members of the HOA? Who can I talk to about why this might not be a good idea? Who can I talk to about what we could do differently and sort of how, like align your your power and your messaging together to drive for that change and drought you know crisis is is an opportunity to do things differently to get different policies through like around dark gray water kitchen sink water is considered black water but there's a policy opportunity or need in the last drought in 2015 we created a demonstration landscape water saving landscape at an hoa and hoas are a tough nut to crack so engaging in those conversations like connor's saying is important and we're also aware that there's a lot of fear around mulch relative to defensible space. And so we're, we're talking with the city of Petaluma um, and, and looking at how do we integrate these complicated bits of messaging to encourage people to still use mulch, but to do it in, in the right way and also make sure it's fire safe and then dispel some of the concerns that are out there. So we're, we're, we're in processing on, on helping putting together some messaging for these things. All right, so that was a lot of information that we just threw at you. Thanks for, for riding along and listening and hopefully opening up perspective to, to new ideas. Um, and before we jump into this next section, I'd love to hear again from all of you what, you know, we think about civic engagement, we have a few examples of what that might look like on the screen. I'd love to know how you're engaging civically already. And uh, Serena, if you could go ahead and launch our second poll, we have a few options. Um, and if, if the way that you're engaging civically isn't on the poll, uh, we'd love to read to enter it in the chat so that we can uh, hear what, what you are up to and maybe all of us can learn a new opportunity. As you're doing the poll tour when you're done, John put a valuable 
point in there about how to water our trees, watering deeply versus in a shallow way. Um, John's on the, count, the city tree committee and very involved in other ways and keeping our trees alive so they could keep sequestering carbon and providing food, habitat, shade, all that kind of thing is very important. All right, so we've got our results in. A lot of folks volunteer with advocacy or activist groups and organizations. I uh, love to see that, you know, combining that power of small. About half of us are engaging with local policy decisions, similarly working with a group on a community project. And we have a few people who are new to civic engagement, um, which is awesome. I hope that uh, this is a jumping off point. So with that, let's let's talk a little bit about civic engagement and different forms and the importance of it. So I'll just if you want to lead us off. Sure, I'll kick off briefly. And I just want to, you know, kind of set the context with some inspiration that a lot of you people on the call are involved in making happen, but 15 years ago, we started doing landscape transformations with cities and building civic engagement by transforming a city hall landscape or a community uh, lawn into a food forest, those sort of activities. So we've been blessed to partner with Petaluma and other agencies for a long time doing this work and, and are now seeing the benefits of that these landscapes that like the Kavanaugh Center food forest in our neighborhood um, apparently sequesters about 13, 13 times as much carbon as a lawn from a study that a local business recently did. And so they also have a lot of powerful benefit. But in recent years, you know, the climate engagement with Climate Action Petaluma working with the city to become the first city in the county to declare climate emergency, and then other groups around the county worked. And collectively in the last few years from citizen effort, every single community, city, jurisdiction in the county and the county have declared a climate emergency and many are taking bigger steps. And we're the only county in the whole country that's done that, which is amazing. It, it, it's sad in a way, but it's very positive in the civic engagement. And a lot of this activity in Petaluma has resulted in the formation of the Climate Commission and the creation of this 50 page people powered climate emergency framework that the city honed down is adopted as the guide for our general plan update, all these activities. John Tribbs and others founded Relief Petaluma. There's new groups forming. And so excited to see how many people are civically engaged and want to connect the dots between efforts. And for folks who haven't yet, it's a great time to jump into the waters because just there's this groundswell. You know, two of our council members, our new council members, our vice mayor Barnacle and council member Posake are both, you know, they're engaged citizens who volunteer with groups and then they ran for council in part because the civic engagement happening. Um, and so, you know, the city has, a, we'll put notes or um, a link to it, but the city has commission applications due in the next week or so for people to apply to be on a commission. And there's groups to get involved with. Maybe you end up starting a new group or connecting the dots between other groups. But just wanna say there's, you know, like civic engagement from the on the ground solutions to getting the policies in place that are equitable and, and address the interconnection of drought and climate and these issues, and then get us together on the ground in our communities, transforming one house, one neighborhood at a time. Um, it, it's what's needed in the world badly. And it's just a really powerful, exciting time to, to step into this. So, so excited for, for y'all to keep doing what you're doing and connect the dots between efforts or maybe launch new ones. Um, and I'll pass that on to, I think, Connor, are you going next? On Sunrise? I think so, yeah. So that's a little more context to, to what Trayton was talking about, with sort of ripple effects of the, the work that the community in Petaluma has done going throughout the county. And hopefully with some of these um, newer code changes, we'll see some, some national replication. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is, the in the poll we asked about you know, volunteering with, with groups that engage in activism and advocacy. Um, and that's definitely been outlet aside from the work that I do with Daily Acts, which much of the work I do with Daily Acts is working with networks and coalitions as well. But um, when I, ever since I went on my hike and made the film, I've been 
uh, volunteering with the Sunrise Movement, which is a national movement of young people to slow down the climate crisis and create millions of good jobs in the process. Um, if you're not familiar with Sunrise, back in 2018, right after the midterm elections, which Sunrise did a lot of on the ground work for advocating for progressive uh, candidates, they really popularized the idea of a Green New Deal and had a really outsized impact on um, President Biden's climate platform once he had become the Democratic nominee. Um, locally, our Sunrise Movement Hub, we engage in lots of different kinds of action. We do art actions that are sort of direct communications to the community. We endorsed seven different candidates for city council around the county in this last election cycle, and five of them won including um, Petaluma council members, Brian Barnacle and Dennis Posake. But to me, what's really powerful about Sunrise, aside from the way that these this youth led movement of kids, you know, some of the people I work with are 15, 16 year old kids who are so fired up and have such clear vision about not just injustice, but also the future that they want to build that takes everyone into account, provides for everyone, and deals with the climate crisis in a holistic and thoughtful, comprehensive way. Um, but it's also just a such a well for continued inspiration and energy because you have people of like mind and heart working on this shared project. Um, it's just extremely energizing. So on the slide, we have a, a small sampling of some of the groups that have volunteer opportunities or you can plug in with to collaborate with people who have similar goals. Um, different focuses, whether um, mostly climate emission side focused or climate justice focused, forests on and on. Uh, we'll be including links for these groups in the follow-up email so that you can figure out if any of them call to you and that you can plug in with them as well. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Carrie. All right. Um, so I will keep this pretty brief, um, but I want to read a, a quote on my theme of relationships um, and really recognizing how critically important equity is in the form of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, that it's very important to recognize that equity isn't just the recognition of racial or cultural divides, but also thinking about it in terms of how can we develop sustainable long-term relationships across a plethora of different issues. And this is from the Youth Mycelium Network. Um, because we recognize, all of us in this, in this Zoom room, um, I'm sure, know that the effects of climate change um, are hitting folks rendered most vulnerable by racist systems um, the hardest. We're seeing that around climate change, the pandemic, um, and it's too often that we see in spaces of civic and policy making civic engagement spaces um, that they don't reflect the cultural diversity and wisdom and beauty of our communities as a whole. Um, so I want to kind of lift up in the space of civic engagement the critical importance of building these thoughtful, respectful relationships across difference, especially with systemically underrepresented folks, um, to, to start listening with, with them. And that's something that Daily Acts takes really point of center in our Leadership Institute and our Petaluma Equitable Climate Action Coalition um, is, is listening to folks who haven't been at the table, checking our assumptions and, and really understanding what barriers exist, what cultural wisdom is helping these communities um, stay resilient, um, and what cultural values are really important to embed in the solution designs um, and ideas to addressing climate change. Um, so I mentioned a little bit, we've got the climate, but Petaluma Equitable Climate Action Coalition, which for Daily Acts um, involves creating more seats at the table for systemically underrepresented folks in the climate change conversation. Uh, we're offering stipends to help financially honor the time and energy of people going through this program and helping them build their analysis skills of understanding climate change, um, soil biology, um, the, the value of trees in the, in the ecosystem of climate change so that they can be empowered um, advisors in our, in, our, in our conversations around how do we 
as a community come together around climate change. Um, so when in person also looking at how we're creating spaces through civic engagement that are culturally inclusive, um, offering this financial support, childcare, food, and, and fun. Um, so that's really important paradigm shift that we wanted to uplift here in, in the theme of power of small is, is the small changes that help create these communities of belonging, create spaces of inclusivity, um, and challenging the assumption that the folks in power are already the ones uh, making the decisions because we need everybody at the table. Um, and those who are most impacted um, really need to be a part of the solution. So I um, wanted to share what we're doing with uh, in collaboration with the city of Petaluma and the, and the Petaluma Climate Action Coalition. Um, it's, it's a really important project in terms of building bridges with the city, with the city staff, and bringing these new voices to the table in a bridge building effort um, that is looking at how can we together um, look at what these goals are and build solutions and a pathway forward. So I'll hand that back over to you, Connor. Well, I was actually going to ask if, uh, as we move into talking about some upcoming opportunities for civic engagement, if you wanted to lead us off talking about uh, the tree ordinance and or any of these three opportunities. Yeah, and I see John Trips is, is mentioning in the chat as well. I do actually think it starts a little bit earlier, um, but tomorrow's Board of Supervisors meeting is a packed one. The morning is focused on cannabis ordinance and the afternoon, I believe starting at two o'clock, um, is the tree ordinance. Um, it'll be quite a long time. So um, if you're interested in public speaking on that, it's a fantastic opportunity. Um, this is a really important step for updating a long outdated um, tree protection ordinance, which really should be wild ecosystem and working woodlands, not just individual trees, these are about ecosystems and forests um, that currently have very minimal protections. Um, and we're losing about a hundred acres a year um, being cleared for um, development in Sonoma County. So um, in terms of carbon sequestration, it is a much greater investment in um, our sequestration toolkit to protect the large old growth trees that we already have rather than trying to recreate what, what nature already does so well because you really can't replace and regrow entire ecosystems. You can grow a tree, but an ecosystem is what has the carbon sequestering capacity that we need more than ever. Um, so we would love your help. It's a perfect civic engagement opportunity. Um, we need every voice we can get. Um, to speak on May 18th or send a letter to the Board of Supervisors. Um, and I'll put in the chat too, if you follow Sonoma County Conservation Action on Facebook, they will have real-time live updates as the agenda progresses. So you can um, keep that on the side and log in for public comment right at the right time. That's awesome. I love that uh, SCC is doing that. I, you never know when things get moved around on an agenda, it's really helpful. And I would just add that not only are old growth trees and forest ecosystems so critical to carbon sequestration, but as we're learning from the new water paradigm, they're you know, paramount for our managing our water cycle and our local climate. You know, we know that trees actually have the effect of seeding rain, like traditional wisdom has said for thousands of years, rain follows the forest. Well, we now know by you know, the verification of science that that is absolutely true. So as we're sitting here in a drought, cutting down trees feels counterproductive to say the least. Um, and with that, Trayton, do you want to talk about either or both of these um, city of Petaluma opportunities? Yeah, I think just, you know, we're, again, we're in this really fortunate time where we have like the cities and the agencies are so taxed with crisis after crisis after response, but our partners on city staff, our council, they're super engaged and wanna take action in these ways. And they really appreciate from all of us taking action at home and in our neighborhood to save water and be resilient, to inspire and engage other neighbors, to again, showing up at the climate commission meetings, um, council meetings, applying to do civic duty by applying to be on a commission for you know the Parks and Recs Commission. That's a really important commission going forward to promote these sort of regenerative visions. 
Um, so, so just want to say, yeah, it's, a, it's an exciting time to be engaged. We are working closely with the city of Petaluma, as well as a bit with the water agency in other cities on, on, you know, as we have for a long time in drought response, how do we um, create integrated solutions for residents? So keep your eyes out. Well, there will be some, some messaging and some campaign action coming in the not too distant future um, that we're in process on. All right, thank you for that. So um, if we're, we're gonna take some questions if folks have any about anything we talked about. We can talk, as well as, you know, we're talking about civic engagement now, so that might be a good place to start. Um, but if you have any questions from the presentation uh, before we ask one more question of you all, uh, now's the time. And since we don't have any off the bat here yet, maybe I'll pivot and put a question to you. And if questions occur to you over the next few minutes, feel free to ask them in the chat. So what we wanna know um, on the heels of us, you know, talking to you is how can you help one another be drought and climate heroes? What can you offer to people in your community? What do you need help with? And um, you can either share this in the chat as we have been doing, or if you'd rather uh, share out loud with us, if you use the raise hand function, we can, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to unmute you so that you can share over audio. And then one other thing, if you're, you know, what, what action are you inspired to take, be it at home, you know, with your gray water or transforming your lawn or being civically engaged? So Melissa shared a tool in the chat, Calscape, great resource for identifying which native plants you can select for your garden. We know that native plants that adapted to this climate over millennia are best suited for dealing with cycles of drought, but they also have a relationship just as old with the soil biology, which helps them sequester more carbon than a plant that doesn't have that ecological relationship. So the impact of native plants over adaptives and plants from further are, uh, and of course, for the pollinators, the ecosystem relationship, right? They provide habitat, they provide food, um, a, lot of, a lot of bang for your buck, so to speak, planting natives. So we have a question again from Dale about the HOA. We need, or a need rather, we need examples of retrofits and ongoing maintenance costs. Who best can do the design and implementation? Do you mean um, the design and implementation of a landscape or are you thinking more about uh, gray water or things of that nature? Landscape. Um, with, where, could you remind me where you're calling in from? East side Petaluma. So John Tribbs just mentioned in the chat, there are a couple landscape designers who are experts in native plantings and water saving. If people who are here right now would like to make recommendations, um, I would welcome that. We also have a few folks we worked with through daily acts that we can recommend, but I love connecting you all uh, with needs and things you can offer. So maybe John, if you have, know of any specifics, specific designers or uh, companies you could recommend. April Owens, Habitat Corridor Projects. April is lovely, super knowledgeable, great to work with. Um, we also have Howard Formby, so there are lots of examples, uh, right, of common areas, not people's houses. So Daily Axe has quite a few model sites that are what we consider civic sites. So say the, the Petaluma Library, Petaluma City Hall, 
um, that might serve as good examples. And we have some case studies on our website that we can send to you um, in a follow-up email. Trayton, you have Trayton or Carrie, you have any thoughts there? Just um, do, you know, do, needs more details. You can reach out to us and give us more details about the place and the location, all those sort of things. Because sometimes in our with our city partners, they'll be interested in doing a demonstration project, like tied in with the city's mulch madness program, which is a great program to be used. So you need more details on it. But in addition, to, I was at the guard the library garden today, which is beautiful. There's gummy berries you can pick and eat. Um, it's it's a great landscape and like. Connor said, we have details on those installs. Perfect, Annie just put information about the Mulch Madness program. Um, let's see, I saw another question here. John wants to know, oh, a film question. So in making the film, I had lots of help with extra videos, pictures and music. How did you get all of that to come together? Um, well, I can start with the music, which is all the music was uh, use rights were granted to me. Uh, I know all the musicians who contribute music to the film, so they were happy to to let me use it uh, in service of the cause, <laughs> so to speak. And as far as pictures and other, like external footage, I either used um, Creative Commons license stuff, and because it's a non-commercial project. Um, there's no issue there. Or I reached out to people for explicit permission to use videos. And we did, I did source a couple of historical photos from a museum in New Mexico. Um, but otherwise everything was contributed for free. It was really a community effort every step of the way, which is one of my favorite details about the film. I'm seeing the link for, for Mulch Madness. We also have a, a webinar from last month that gives you all the details you could want about Mulch Madness and um, sheet mulching in general. Any other questions, thoughts, takeaways, actions you're excited to pursue or implement? Things you'd like to see change or done through civic engagement or home scale solutions? All right. Well, a good resource oh. for you on there. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Well, with Matt, you know, if any questions come up in the next few minutes as we as we wrap up here, uh, feel free to pop those in the chat. So we have a few events coming up in the very near future, and Carrie, maybe you could give us a little blurb. Yes, um, so if you're ready to stretch your leadership muscles, um, we have our Learn About the Leadership Institute for Just and Resilient Communities um, event this Wednesday, uh, May 19th from 7 to 8 p.m., which is a fantastic opportunity to learn about this 10-month transformational leadership program um, that works to provide exposure to inspirational change agents across efforts of sustainability, equity, environment, and economy. Um, while offering educational skill building and experience around collaborating on issues on the confluence, at the confluence of social justice and environmental justice. Um, so we'll have um, two of the current fellows to um, speak about their experience this year. This is the 20 year old program with over 500 graduates um, and a really amazing way to grow your network, um, make connections, deepen into civic engagement, um, and, and grow your grow your leadership wings. Um, so we'd love to have you join. Um, we'll put a, a link to sign up is in the chat. Um, and if you can't make it that evening, if you sign up, we'll be sure to send you the, the 
um, recording afterwards. So um, feel free to send um, out to anybody you think might be interested too, any high potential emerging leaders in the community um, that would just shine given this opportunity. Thank you, Carrie. So we have an event with the city of Katadi coming up next Wednesday, all about growing healthy soils, which as we now know is one of the most critical components to repairing the small water cycle. Um, we'll be talking about concepts, kind of soil basics, and also all kinds of practices you can implement at home. And then uh, in, I saw there was a question about gray water in the chat. Um, we'll definitely answer that, but the, one of the best places to get all of your questions answered about gray water uh, is right here on our Zoom channel on Thursday, June 3rd, in partnership with the city of Petaluma. We've been doing a series of monthly garden office hours. Most recently, we did one on plant selection, but June's topic is gray water. So Liz and Serena will have a brief presentation about kind of the core concepts of gray water that you can implement at home. And then there will be an open discussion um, meeting format. So lots of face-to-face -to, -face, um, to, to answer any questions you have. And then beyond that, we have some very detailed gray water resources and some webinar recordings with Laura Allen of Gray Water Action, who is an absolute mastermind when it comes to creatively reusing and recycling water and also catching and storing water. Um, so that's, those, are, those are excellent resources I would recommend to anyone who's at all interested in either gray water or rainwater. And uh, to answer your question, John, um, I believe dishwasher, Trayton, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe dishwasher, dishwasher water like kitchen sinks is considered black water currently, but um, there's the potential for that to change. However, the, I would say the easiest gray water, um, when you, the, you're asking about the easiest water pipe to plumb, the easiest system and the type you don't need um, a permit for is what's called laundry to landscape, which is what most of our gray water work is focused on. Um, but Trayton, maybe you could share briefly about your experience of doing sh um, tub and shower. Sure. Um, well, I think, you know, so at the personal scale, dishwash, I've been using dishwasher, dishwash water for a long time, getting that shifted at as far as state legality as a process. There's a, some cities have already uh, adopted um, pilot uh, positions on doing it and calling it dark gray water. So I think you're going to see that come through time, like living in a permanent drought. We just have to use these resources more wisely. But taking your pot out in the sink and putting it in your laundry or, you know, in your garden is great. You do want to be mindful of the soaps you're using and, you know, if there's meats and things like that. Um, but as far as, yeah, so the gray water goes at a high level. Laundry landscape doesn't need a permit. And then there's a next level for a single gray water system, your shower or bath needs a plumbing change permit. And I haven't been is I'd have to, you know, this is from a while ago. So I'd trust our, our team on more of the current detail. And then if you do more complicated systems, you have to get a more detailed permit. So from no permit to a simple plumbing change permit to more complicated permits is my understanding of how the code still lives. Excellent. Well, we are just about at time here. So again, I want to thank the city of Petaluma and also a big shout out to our sponsors. Without both the sponsors and uh, our city contracts, we love Petaluma. We wouldn't be able to bring these awesome events to all of you and get to meet you and hear your thoughts. So deep gratitude to all of these wonderful folks. And then um, deep gratitude to all of you for being here today. Um, it was so lovely to be in community with you all. Um, Trayton, Carrie, any closing thoughts? Carrie? Um, no, I just um, also deep gratitude for being in community and forming these relationships. And um, I hope to see you out um, at a daily acts event as we slowly return to in-person, rolling up our sleeves and, and getting in the dirt. 
Yeah, I know, I know several of you on the call and how engaged you are. And so just really appreciating the work you're doing in the community and that Daily X gets to be a part of it with you. So thanks, thanks all for everything you're doing to reclaim the power of your small actions and power the small groups that do change our communities and world. And thanks, Connor, for a great film. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's my pleasure to share it. All right. Well, I hope everyone has a lovely evening. And as Carrie mentioned, I hope to see you at an event or at a tree ordinance board of supervisors meeting, perhaps in the very near future. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Take care. Good night.